Good evening, Pastor Mark Johnson, Life Tabernacle Church in Elkhart, Indiana, also Elkhart Life. We're glad that you're here today uh, for our Wednesday night Bible study. I'm very thankful that you join us each week for this opportunity to study the Word of God. So very important that we join together, especially during this time of chaos and uh, uh, pandemic, and now we've got rioting in the streets and major cities and protesting. Uh, the tragic, tragic killing, murder, really, of a black man in Minneapolis has created quite a response uh, across the nation. Uh, much of it driven by um, Antifa, much of the, the uh, attacks at least driven by Antifa and some other organizations that their goal is to create a sense of chaos. But don't let that distract you from the real uh, starting issue. Starting issue was the death of a black man under the knee of a white man, a uh, police officer in the streets. Uh, we had a leadership meeting last night and uh, one of our men said that uh, he had been coming into my neighborhood and visiting someone and had been stopped uh, four times by the same sheriff as he was pulling out of our neighborhood and got the same interview. What are you doing? Why are you here? What are the boxes in your car? That kind of uh, inquisitive, uh, I think you're stealing questioning and I was shocked and appalled. I have a neighbor who's black. I have a neighbor across the street from me who's Hispanic. I have uh, my neighbor on the right is a uh, black family. They've been there for almost the whole time that I've been there. And uh, I can't imagine in my neighborhood, which is uh, somewhat racially diverse, uh, that that would happen and that, that he would stop him repeatedly uh, to, um, to inquire. Um, he never mishandled him necessarily, but, but the whole idea that he just stopped him because he saw him pulling out of our neighborhood was really very shocking to me. Um, and shouldn't, I'm sure, if I, I'm not black and I've never had those experiences, they call it driving while black, but if you're a black man, um, you probably have had those experiences. I have uh, a gr really good friend of mine whose son was in college on an athletic scholarship and I think my kid said he was stopped 17 times uh, because he was a young black man driving a relatively nice car and uh, he became a target repeatedly. I, I understand some of that um, and I'm sure there are um, other folks who get stopped on a regular basis because they may look suspicious, but it just feels like, at least to the black community, that they're being targeted, especially black men are being targeted. I read, I may have relayed this earlier, but I read of a uh, article of a man who is a Christian all of his life, lived in Alabama, and had a wife and two small kids, went to go gas up her car, and while there, an uh, uh, elderly white lady began giving him the eye. She uh, pulled over to the edge of the parking lot at the gas station and uh, made a phone call and sat and watched him. And he could tell that she was focused on him. And he didn't know what or why, so he just got his gas. And before he could get away from the pump, police pull up. They question him. There's been a robbery. They thought it was him because it was black. There was no description uh, given to him other than there was a black man who had robbed uh, a few blocks away. And so it must be you because you're a black man. And they uh, started to arrest him. They started putting him in handcuffs. And an elderly white man came out of the store and said, no, it couldn't have been him. The robbery happened down there and he was from down there. And so only by the voice of the white man did they allow the black man to go home to his wife and kids when he just was going to get gas. Um, and I, I can't imagine how that must feel um, to uh, have that kind of thing happen. And um, there are those, though, that are using this confusion to, to uh, leverage, to divide, to destroy. Um, and it's really very, very crazy. Isaac uh, 
put me on to a video that's on Fox News currently of a, um, a very, very expensive car, $330,000 Rolls Royce, pull up in front of a store and the occupants jump out, run into the store, raid the store, come running out with clothes or items out of the store, not paid for, the windows and doors were broken into, and they jump in a $330,000 car and drive away. Um, wow, that just doesn't make sense. Um, and it doesn't fit the narrative that some of the news stations are pushing that it's angry, um, impoverished uh, people that are angry at wealth and prestige. If you drive up in a $330,000 car and you loot a store, uh, unless you stole the car, and that may be, um, it's really, that's not the narrative. And so the narrative that the news is trying to push doesn't fit. Anyway, I'm going to leave that subject uh, just to say um, you don't always know what the other man does, what uh, he has to go through to be in the positions that he's in. Let's at least be sensitive. We want to be a very racially diverse congregation. Um, I want that. I want God to uh, bless black, white, yellow, brown, whoever, whatever color, blue, purple, yellow, um, that they're welcome in our church and that God wants to move in their hearts and lives. So I'm talking on a subject I think applies in that, but it's a little different subject. And I want to talk about tonight uh, unity, the biblical concept of unity, but not as it applies to us, but I really want it to apply to um, Scripture. I want us to understand how Scripture is unified and there is a central theme to the Word of God and you can see that central theme and by that central theme in the Word of God you can realize that the Bible is an integrated whole. It's not just a, um, a random set of books put together but there is a overwhelming purpose to Scripture. The Bible claims to be the divinely inspired Word of God. The New Testament says holy men of old wrote as they were moved on by the Holy Ghost. So this is a God-breathed book that you and I subscribe to, that we hold uh, dear, that we believe in. It's very difficult for some of our young people who have been trained in very, very liberal public schools to grasp the concept of truth. I know for most of us that are listening to this Bible study tonight, it's unlikely that you're wrestling with whether there is a truth or not. But some of our young people absolutely wrestle with the idea of truth. They can't even decide if gender is true. Um, I recently saw a news article where a 13-year-old uh, young person wrote a blog with her father's help and they said, I'm done with um, sexual identity. There is just no sexual identity. There's no male or female or anything else. You can't label me as anything. I'm none of those things. Um, I grew up, was born this way, I lived this way, and I'm not going to be defined by any definition. I'm going to be undefined, in fact. Um, and that was highly touted by the media as the newest way to think about gender identity. But the truth is, you're born with a gender. Um, you're born with physical characteristics. You're born with chemical characteristics. Gender is actually a chemical identity while you're in the womb. And if you have a chemical applied to a growing zygote, it turns into a male. And if that chemical is not applied, then that zygote turns into a female. Uh, and it's a chemical process that creates a sexual identity. That's science. That's not even scripture. That's science. But it's also scripture. Uh, for those that want to debate science and scripture, 
So if you're wrestling with your identity, if you're wrestling with who you are and uh, who made you and how you're made and and you're going to pick your own identity, you're going against the identity that you uh, were born with, then there's certainly a lot of confusion. And that shows a disconnect from truth. That shows a disconnect from, I would call it a disconnect from reality. So the Bible does claim to be the divinely inspired Word of God, and uh, I believe that it is. And so we want to talk about that. I, I mentioned... Uh, I had a conversation on Sunday with a gentleman who came by the church after everybody left. And he said, I want evidence. I want proof. I, I want to know something. And I said, well, that's not faith. You can't know something and call it faith. That's already evidence in the past. It's not faith for the future. And so um, we have to have faith to believe. But there is evidence that helps us to believe what we believe. So I want to talk about the evidence. The evidence for the inspiration of the Bible falls into two general categories. There's some evidence classified as external. Otherwise, the, um, the evidence is not contained inside the pages of this book. It is outside the pages. Either science proves it, or archaeology proves it, or some other uh, methodology can prove uh, history uh, can prove or at least prove parts, segments of what the Bible says is true. Uh, in the early 19th century, there was a movement on, even in uh, Christian scholarship, that none of the Bible was true. None of the Old Testament was true. Very little of the New Testament was true. There was no archaeological evidence or very little archaeological evidence. But it's pretty interesting, and I've talked about this. I won't belabor the point because uh, I'm going to talk about it later. Archaeology now shows uh, everywhere the Bible says something happened. If they can find archaeological evidence, it's at that location where the Bible says that it happened. And they found people's names. They found city names. They found governor's names. They found a variety of names in a variety of sources buried deep in the ground that they've been able to dig up. So those are external sources, but there's also internal sources, sources in Scripture that you can find uh, something written 500 years before happens in this particular moment, and there's a reference to it, and those references line up. Most people that attack Scripture try to attack Scripture by what they say are inequities, um, disagreements in Scripture. Um, I'm not going to really deal with disagreements. I'm not trying to um, deal with that as an issue. We're not trying to do a real in-depth study. But I want to encourage you. I don't believe any of those actually disagree with each other. On the surface, they look like they do. But I don't believe they do, and you can't prove that they actually do disagree. They're different perspectives, and they may have different information. And uh, we're just uncertain in um, some of the meanings of some of the scriptures, how they applied them differently. But they do show in a couple places numerical differences is one place that people like to uh, berate scripture over because they believe that proves uh, that scripture is inaccurate. I don't believe that proves that at all. So there's internal and external uh, evidences of uh, what the Bible says. So, archaeological, I'll deal with this just a little bit. For instance, artifacts from the field of archaeology corroborate the historical statements of Scripture with external evidence. And here's one particular example. Uh, Nabodia cylinder, an example would be the discover, discovery of the cylinder demonstrates Belshazzar was an actual Babylonian king and not a mythical character as some early critics contended. Uh, and there's the reference and even the page number of that reference that people criticized uh, the idea that Belshazzar was a real individual. And you have archaeological evidence on a tablet or a cylinder. And then you have um, certain proofs of biblical inspiration are internal in character. They're part of the fabric of the book itself. They're self 
authenticating phenomena within the Bible that demonstrate must have been orchestrated by a uh, superintending mind, someone who is in charge of it, someone who's directing it, because it happens centuries apart. One evidence is the unity of the characteristics that is the characteristics of the Bible. Uh, why is it relevant? Several important facts about the Bible. The book was written approximately by 40 different men in three different languages, Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. Its composition occurred over a vast span of time from the Pentateuch or possibly the book of Job was penned even earlier. Scholars are uncertain. Some really do believe Job was the first um, book that was ever penned that was included in the Bible. To the final compilation, though, of Revelation is 1,600 years of history that were involved. If you think about that, they came out a, uh, a wide variety of cultural backgrounds. Moses, who is believed to write the, five, the first five books of the Bible called the Pentateuch, um, he was uh, raised in Egypt, spent most of his life in Egypt as an Egyptian, as an Egyptian ruler, and yet the characteristics of the first five books of the Bible are not distinctly Egyptian. Uh, they have a different characteristic. They have a different dedication and focus on one God. But they were written, the Bible was written by shepherds, fishermen, professionals like Paul, scholars, and Paul would be characterized as a scholar. Isaiah would be characterized as a scholar. Very intelligent men, very gifted men in, the natural, in their natural abilities. They're very uh, brilliant individuals. So in view of this fact, we might expect the final form of scriptures to be a tangled mishmash. Can you imagine a shepherd and a theologian writing the same kind of ideas and that their ideas completely mesh together? Um, it's pretty hard to get two people in a room and have them agree. Uh, Matt Yader and I were on the phone yesterday, I think it was, and... Uh, Matt was telling me uh, of a particular scripture he was thinking about and writing about, and, and he made a statement, nobody can disagree with this, and uh, nobody would ever fight this. this. This proves my point. And I said, oh, so you're telling me two theologians would never argue over this point, and actually he and I have argued over points mm, a number of times over the years. I'll just leave it at that don't want to throw Matt under the bus, uh, and sometimes I've listened to him, and most of the time he's listened to me. Um, it's very hard to get people to agree on the same facts. If you have an accident and you have three people standing on three different corners, you're going to get three different stories of what happened in that accident. Rarely, unless they get together and talk together, rarely will those messages a line. There will always be some distinctions between, first of all, perspective allows them to see from a different side. Uh, lots of other reasons. I'll move on. There is such a thing as the, uh, the cultural backgrounds that each of them were raised in. One was raised in Egypt. Some were raised in Babylon, uh, a completely different culture. Some were raised in Jerusalem. Some were raised in the outlying areas as shepherds. Some were raised as uh, uh, prophets, priests. There were in the New Testament, most of them were agricultural workers, except for Paul. They were all um, uh, fishermen, uh, sh shepherders, uh, sheep herders. Um, uh, take care of cows, take care of farms, whatever, grapes, dates, whatever it was that they raised. And uh, even a tax collector in the middle of that. Uh, such a wide variety, but all of them focus and agree on one thing. That really, that one thing is that Jesus Christ is the, uh, the God that came down to man. So, in the harmony of ideas, it's hardly the case that men will agree. The Bible is characterized by such an astounding harmony and consistent flow that it utterly defies any naturalistic explanation. Unquestionably, there is a unifying source behind its composition. 
it speaks from the very beginning in Genesis of um, God speaking to uh, Eve and speaking to the snake and, and prophesying that the seed of a woman would uh, bruise the head of the snake and that there would be damage done, a fatal damage um, to the snake's head. And uh, when Jesus is born, he's not the seed of man. He's the seed of God and the seed of woman. That's how you know that Jesus was of Mary. Because scripture said in the very beginning that he would be seed of woman. And again, you would know that he wasn't seed of man because the scripture didn't say that. And the implication then in the New Testament is that well, it says the Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary and she was with child. So the child within her was birthed by the Spirit of God that overshadowed her. And so he was God and man, just like Genesis tells you. Very important that we understand how accurate Scripture is, how prophetic it is, and how completely fulfilled those prophecies really are. Are. So there's a unifying source. It is the Spirit of God. And it says, uh, though the Bible were a magnificent sympathy, symphony. <laughs> I'm going to struggle with words all night. That clearly was orchestrated by a single master conductor. I had a friend who was a, uh, a, a conductor. He was actually a master pianist from China. And we met and we started trying to do Bible studies together. And we were looking at going to Hong Kong, and, and I wanted to pick up some of his culture, and he wanted to pick up some American culture. And so it was a great fit. Uh, he was, uh, again, a master pianist. He had been, uh, been gifted a scholarship to Indiana University Music School, but he practiced so many hours a day that he damaged his hands and could no longer play at that level. He could play. He was a incredible pianist. He actually got up on our grand piano at church and played beautifully. Just amazing um, music came out of his hands. But he had to change his focus and become a composer of music. And one of his compositions was played in... Um, New York in one of the symphony halls in the opening season of the uh, New York Philharmonic, they played his composition as one of their opening songs for the year. His skill was such that he understood music, not just piano, but all music. And he had to put all the instruments down on paper and how it was going to sound and create a symphony. Uh, it was uh, stunningly beautiful. He played some of it for us on the piano. Beautiful music, but it was very complex, and each part had to come in at a certain time, otherwise it would all uh, ram together and wouldn't sound good at all. And you can see that in Scripture. God laid out the plan, and He had the oboes and the drums and the cymbals all come in on time, when he wanted them to come in. So in the end, it was a beautiful symphony. My wife and I went a few years ago. We happened to be at the hospital and heard the Elkhart Symphony practicing in the park on Tuesday nights, or actually playing an outdoor concert on a Tuesday night. And her and I walked over and sat down in the outdoor uh, benches and listened to the entire concert. It was beautiful. It was really very cool. It was a nice summer evening and a, a beautiful experience. But that music all played together creates something as each of those pieces are laid out. And that's what I'm telling you tonight. And most of us already know that. But we have some newer folks in our congregation. And you may come across someone who attacks or assaults the idea that the Word of God is perfect harmony. But if you look at the whole of Scripture and you understand the whole of Scriptures, which is what we're trying to do tonight, you're going to see a, um, a harmony. There are unity types. There are thematic unities in Scripture. There are several lines of evidence that show this unity that the Scripture has. Um, there's a unity that saturates the divine oracles. The Bible is the story of one problem, sin. And only one solution, Jesus Christ. 
all of the Old Testament lays out sin and man's inability to overcome sin. And the New Testament lays out Jesus' ability to overcome sin. Scripture says there was no guile found in his mouth. He uh, could not be condemned, although tried three times. They never could find any fault. Um, in fact, it's declared, I can't find fault in this man, Pilate said. He, he literally could not find fault, but they were dissatisfied with that answer and demanded that Jesus Christ be crucified. And he relented and allowed them to do that. So Jesus became the perfect sacrifice for the sin of all mankind, which was laid down way back in Genesis when Adam and Eve sinned and God came down in the garden in the cool of the day and called Adam, Adam, where art thou? Adam and Eve were hiding. They then covered themselves with leaves and finally they came out to God and said, here we are, we were afraid. And uh, God went and slew an animal and took the skin of that animal and gave clothing to Adam and Eve, according to Scripture. And uh, he operated the very first sin of mankind, had the first death to provide a covering for that sin. And that was a knowledge that they were naked and that they were embarrassed. They previously had not been embarrassed. And really, there was nothing to be embarrassed about because they were just Adam and Eve. According to Scripture, there was nobody else on the earth and God married them and they were a married couple. So they shouldn't have been ashamed, but they were ashamed when God came walking to them. They recognized that they were naked and they were ashamed for God who created them to see them naked. And so God clothed them by slaying an animal. Scripture says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. And God calls something to die to create a uh, blood sacrifice and a covering for Adam and Eve's sin. And then Cain and Abel have their issues. Abel slays an animal and offers it as a sacrifice. Cain takes uh, vegetables and offers them as a burnt offering, a sacrifice to God. God accepts the animal sacrifice, but He rejects the... Um, the vegetable sacrifice. And so God clearly again shows that if man sins, something has got to die. And that truth that's laid down in the very, very beginning becomes the truth that Jesus Christ lives as He is being sacrificed. The Bible calls Him a spotless lamb. So you see that Jesus is that solution. That solution's laid out in the very, very beginning. Genesis 3.15 is, is where we were talking a minute ago about the promise seed. In Exodus, he becomes a Passover lamb. As they're exiting out of Egypt, they have to offer a lamb as a sacrifice. They can't break its bones. They have to apply its blood to the doorposts and the lintel, which is the two side uh, bars of a door and the overhead overhang so you're covered by the blood as the blood is applied to the left and the right and over the top of you and the death angel would not enter into your house if you were covered by the blood. If you weren't covered by the blood the death angel would come into your house and that he would take the firstborn of every um, person and animal in that household. So he would take the firstborn of horses, of sheep, of cows, of whatever they had, and the firstborn in the household would be taken. And Pharaoh and all of his uh, people in Egypt woke up in the night and began to scream in the night and demanded Pharaoh drive them out. So the Passover created a, uh, a freedom for, for Israel. They began to head out of slavery, out of bondage, into the promised land. And that release was by the Passover lamb. That is characterized by Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection. As he dies, he opens the door with his blood for all of our sins to be removed from us and for us to be liberated. We are free. He that the Son is set free is free indeed. So you see that in Exodus. In Leviticus, he's typified by uh, the sacrifices that the Levitical law lays down, a variety of sacrifices, each of them are typified in Christ. He 
uh, is some part of that. There's sacrifices for healing, sacrifices for celebration, sacrifices for sin. There's a variety of sacrifices uh, clarified in Leviticus. In Numbers, um, Israel is uh, traveling onto the, into the promised land and they commit sin and Moses has to create a bronze serpent and lifts it up on a pole and if they see the bronze serpent those that have been snake bit by the snakes that the that God had sent in among the people if they saw the brazen serpent they would not die and uh, Israel actually got attached to that brazen serpent and began to worship that brazen serpent as if it was the serpent that gave them their healing it was not but Jesus was going to be the one that was lifted up and if all men would come to him they would be set free he's going to draw all men to him the Word of God says so like the serpent was lifted up and men looked to the serpent and that healed them Jesus was lifted up and we look unto Jesus the author and the finisher of our faith and that heals our soul and can heal our body so those uh, types in the Old Testament are lived out in Jesus Christ. And so the plan is not accidental. It's not happenstance. It doesn't just fall into place. And you really do have to know and at least understand in a general sense some of these truths of the Old Testament to be, be able to understand the truth that Jesus lives in his death, burial, and resurrection. His whole life is headed for that to set mankind free. What great truth. It is all a single fabric. There's a redemption thread. If you compare Genesis and Revelation, the first book of the Bible and the last book of the Bible, uh, it's called the canon, the, the sacred writings. In Genesis, the origin of the word heaven and earth is revealed, Genesis 1 and 1. In Revelation, the consummation of earthly affairs is affected and the old order is replaced by a new heaven and a new earth. Heaven itself, spiritual and in natural, or spiritual in nature, that God is coming down to man, you see in the book of Revelation. So, in the beginning, God comes down, spirit comes down to the earth, creates man, breathes into man the breath of life, and then the Spirit comes down to fill man in the book of Acts with the gift of the Holy Ghost. And then you see in the end, God's Spirit comes back and meets man and catches him out and then brings him back to inhabit and uh, rule and reign with Christ, as the Word of God says. Whatever that looks like, um, we're going to be uh, united with Christ. And Revelation clearly shows that. It says ten thousands of his saints come with him and we're going to establish justice on the earth and there's going to be a, a spiritual reign, thousand years of peace. The lion's going to lay down with the lamb and all that that implies. Um, their uh, tools are going to be put back into plowshares. Their swords and spears, they're going to be used for taking care of the, the turning the fields. So it's going to be a spiritual dominated earth that God and His people will be the overseers of the earth and uh, reign and rule in the earth. And we're going to be one with Christ. So what a powerful, powerful truth. So the Old Testament and the New Testament are bookends to humanity. God comes down to man, man rejects God's plan, lives on his own, learns sin, is enabled to be filled again with the Spirit of God, have the Spirit of God lead, guide, and direct. And for all of those who obey and follow, they're going to rule and reign with Christ according to the Word of God. And God's going to come down and bring spiritual truth to the earth and rule on the earth with spiritual truth, not just carnal natural truth or uh, human plans. It's going to be the plan of God. So again, bookends. The, the deceptive Satan who seduced Adam and Eve is to be cast into hell where he deceives no more. Revelations 20 and 10. So in the beginning, the serpent is uh, uh, Satan in a snake form speaking to Eve. That should have kind of given her a clue to begin with. 
but she listens, has a conversation, and he questions God and uh, creates all this havoc for us. Let me just pause a moment and say, um, questioning God will cause havoc in your own life. You can't get away from God's plans and purpose. You can't get away from God's authority. You can't get away from spiritual authority. And once you start to think, well, I'm going to do my own thing and nobody knows like I know, then you become your own God. You become your own spiritual authority. And the Bible's pretty clear that that's not the way that He intended it to work. And just to give you a little insight here, I talked a little bit about this on Sunday, but I'm, let me reiterate this. God came down to uh, Saul, knocked him off of his horse, and said, go to a street called Straight, and there someone will tell you what to do. God speaking to Saul and doesn't tell him what to do. In fact, he makes him go talk to a man because God wanted it to come through men. Uh, scripture actually says if an angel tells you something different than what's in the Word of God and what's in the preached Word of God, that you shouldn't listen to that because it's anathema, it's accursed. You have to hear the Word of God and the man of God preaching the Word of God. And if you're not going to do that, then that's going to separate you from being a follower of Christ. And actually, you're going to follow a false Christ yourself because you won't listen to the Word of God. You'll only listen to the Word of God as you see it, not as it's preached. And you could say, well, okay, I, I'll be my own preacher then. Well, again, that's never the way it works. You don't find that plan wrapped up in the Word of God. You find uh, holy men of God spoke or wrote as the Spirit spoke to them, and you find preachers delivering the gospel. And God refused to deliver the gospel. Again, God didn't preach Acts 2.38. The Bible says, And then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. Uh, bring this thought to your mind. Think about this for a moment. If God came down, and God was a mighty wind, and a flame of fire, and He spoke out of them in another tongue, in languages that people all over Jerusalem recognize as languages from their disparate provinces all across the, the Mediterranean, then couldn't have God spoke through them in tongues and preached? Couldn't that have happened? And wouldn't it have been more effective maybe if God had preached to them and told them to repent and told them to be baptized? But you don't see that happening. God didn't use that opportunity to preach to people. People declared the goodness of God, but they didn't preach. Peter stood up with the eleven and began to preach to people. This is that that was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And then he had the opportunity when the people responded and said, well, what shall we do? We realize that we may have crucified the Christ, but what are we going to do about that? And then Peter said, repent and be baptized every one of you. The very first sermon on the day of Pentecost, the day the church was born, uh, every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Very important. All of these points are very, very important because God did not speak directly to men and tell them what they needed to do. Why? God does not do that. We hear by preaching. You need to have faith by hearing preaching. It's so important for us to understand this point because so many people get off track on this very, very basic point and they think, well, if you can do it, I can do it and so I'll, I'll just go do it. And that's very much like going up to the top of the mountain and having a prophet of God say, hey, go ahead, throw water on the fire, just barrels of water, just put barrels of water on the fire and let me talk to God. After the other preachers, who followed a different God, had cut themselves and screamed and yelled for days. And I think he pre or prayed a 69, 67-word sermon um, or prayer to God. And God answered by fire, ate all that up. They slew all the prophets of Baal. Uh, 
all of that happened because God wanted to use a man to say what needed to be said. Now, I believe that I'm not the only one that would say what needs to be said. I believe God would use you to say what needs to be said in your circumstances, in your home, amongst your family, maybe with a coworker or a neighbor. I spent a little time with my neighbor this morning and we talked about her overcoming um, an addiction to cigarettes and she brought up the subject and she wanted prayer that God would help her overcome her addiction. And I preached to her as calmly, nicely as I could. Uh, I believe she can overcome that. I believe by the Spirit of God she can overcome her addiction to cigarettes. Why? Either the sun set free is free indeed. I don't believe we should be bound by our addictions. So it's a powerful thing when you stand and talk over the fence with your neighbor or across the uh, cubicle with your friend and uh, maybe playing basketball or golf or something and you tell somebody the good news of Jesus Christ. You become a voice of God for God to mankind that can bring about faith in the hearts of men and the hearts of women. I believe that's all of our purpose. So obedience to Christ, by virtue of obedience to Christ, we're granted an opportunity to become perfect because we were born in sin. In Genesis uh, 3 and 6 showed man's first tendency is disobedience. We don't like to obey. We don't like to obey. We don't like to be told off. We don't like to be forced to do something. In fact, um, it causes lots and lots of people's hackles to rise up if someone tries to tell them what to do. You see that uh, on the news. You see people fighting police officers when the police officer tells them what to do. They're not going to be told what to do. It's the nature of mankind to rebel against authority. We see it in Genesis. I don't know why people would wrestle with the idea of Adam and Eve in Genesis because it really does show the nature of mankind in that, that little simple story of Eve wanting to be God, wanting to have more than what she's got, and rebelling against the plan and the purpose of God, and Adam going along with it, and both of them being cast out of the garden and having to till the soil and give birth through pain to babies, uh, the curse of men and women on the earth. And we've lived that curse ever since because of our own disobedience. So Satan deceives, man obeys, and you have the mess that we're in. Um, I mentioned a little earlier, it's caused by the seed of woman. Uh, Jesus is the center reason for all of it. He is the offspring of David, 22 and 16 of Revelations. By his sacrifice, Genesis 4 and 4, he became in the enthroned Lamb of God, Revelations 2. Um, so all of those things are bound up in Genesis and then in Revelation. Scripture says the sorrow of Eden, Genesis 3.16, is going to be transformed to joy of heaven, Revelations 2, 21 and 4. So again, such comparisons in Genesis in the beginning with the ending. In the beginning, sin brings uh, bondage and uh, shackles into our lives, our spiritual lives, our physical lives. And then in the end, Jesus Christ brings freedom and liberty and peace and joy and love and all of those things that Jesus brings. Saw someone say the problem in our society is not going to be solved uh, through social economic issues. Really, the problems of our society will be solved through Jesus Christ because He brings peace. He is peace. He is love and joy and all those things. And if you have Christ, then you don't have some of the issues that people end up having and they're uh, being angry about, so angry about in their own lives. And I'm not talking about one side versus the other. I think both sides uh, need that. Well, there's probably 15 or 20 sides now in this um ongoing struggle in the streets. There's a lot more than two sides. It's not just the police and the protesters. There's a lot of other agendas being played out here, I believe. So all of those agendas would be better served in Christ. And they could love their neighbor and the Bible says love their enemy. So those things happen. Um, 
the sorrow is transformed to joy, the tree of life. We're separated from Genesis 3, 22 through 24 will be our possession in heaven, uh, Revelations 22 and 14. Appropriately, appropriately, there's a remarkable concurrence, a theme between Genesis and Revelation. The unified plan of redemption is developed throughout Scripture. The plan has a unified um, plan of development and I'm just trying to see how long I'm teaching and I probably need to shut up and close this down and uh, I'll try to deal with the next section next week the design flow and how all this flows together and the scriptures that that really impact it so it's Mark Johnson pastor of Elkhart Life in Elkhart Indiana and it's a real honor to have you with us and uh, worship with you we look forward to being with you Sunday I would say that um, a quick note, Casey Briano was in contact with uh, a young man who now has COVID-19 and uh, he was in contact with him on Friday night at a hyphen event and then he took our young people to a youth event and uh, it's possible that maybe even some of our children uh, could be impacted by this. Casey was at church on Sunday as well. So he is now being quarantined once he found out that uh, this young man has it. He has contacted his uh, boss, the clinics, and he is quarantining himself for 14 days. And I would caution all of us to be aware and be very, very cautious about contact with other people. Um, I don't think we need to be in quarantine, at least not at this point. Um, but if Casey begins to show signs, it may be problematic for some that were around him on Sunday and talking with him. So uh, this is what we've been talking about. This is the reason tonight we're still on uh, video and we're asking us to try our best on Sundays to social distance. I know I broke that uh, on Sunday and having an altar call. I felt like it was very, very important and some testified to me that they believe God really did a work in their life uh, in the altar. And I didn't ask for everybody to come. I invited you. If you're not ever comfortable doing that, please don't. There's no pressure for you to go pray with somebody or be with somebody. Um, but I feel like I should. My responsibility to try and uh, meet people's needs and pray with them. Jesus said, my house shall be called a house of prayer. And if you can't come to church and be prayed with and for, um, uh, it's, it, it, I need to have faith uh, that God's going to be with me, even if I get the disease um, and have to be quarantined myself. So I'm going to try to be as safe as possible for you. I try to wash my hands, uh, sanitize my hands about 15 or 20 times. Uh, during and before and after service, try to keep that going. I want to be as uh, healthy as possible, not just for me, but for you as well. But we do have to be very, very cautious. Um, the, the recovery group is meeting in our parking lot tomorrow night, and they are going to practice social distancing. Um, so we really need to uh, continue this. And we'll let you know Sunday how things are going. The latest numbers are still up in Elkhart. And uh, we've just got to practice safe practices. Look forward to being with you on Sunday. Be very, very safe. Be in prayer. Let's have revival in the midst of all of this. We've had uh, new folks coming. God's doing a work in their life. It's amazing what's happening. We need to pray for Brittany. A young lady's been coming to our church. Her apartment burned and uh, it destroyed everything. Some are raising funds to help her. At some point, she's going to want a, a different apartment and may have to have a down payment. And we're trying to help her. My wife went to get some clothes and we're trying to make sure her baby has food and clothes. And we are trying to help already. If you'd like to help that, you can just write Brittany on an offering envelope, drop it in the plate on Sunday, and uh, we'll make sure that she gets that and we'll make sure that it's handled correctly and appropriately and applied in a way that benefits her long term and is not wasted, okay? She is okay right this second. She's with her boyfriend's mother and they're at her house and they can be there for a couple of weeks. So at this moment, she's okay and the baby's taken care of. It didn't hurt her or the baby. 
Her husband was in the apartment at the time and fell asleep um, and likely caused the incident himself um, by accident, but he came out with a few minor burns and is doing okay without any long-term um, difficulty. Has some smoke inhalation damage and uh, uh, there was some damage to some other apartments in the complex. So we're very thankful that nobody was killed or injured, uh, at least severely. But please pray for Brittany. Please pray for those uh, we've sent out that have recently had a death. Uh, Ed's mother had uh, passed away. Her funeral will be next Tuesday. And then um, Sister uh, Cruz's sister has passed away. I'm not sure when that funeral is happening. We'll try to let you know as we find out. Okay? So thank you very much. Love you. Praying for you. Prayed for you today that the Lord will be with you and strengthen you. God bless you in Jesus' name.